Okay, so in this video we're going to discuss Euclid's division lemma, which is a very rigorous way of saying and proving something that is intuitively rather obvious, but it's nevertheless um, very important in number theory, um, and it it's very important to be able to prove even those very obvious things, and it's actually a pretty tricky proof in some ways. So this is the statement of the of the theorem. For any integers k, where k is positive, and j, there exists uh, there exist unique integers q and r such that um, r is greater than or equal to zero and less than k, and uh, j is equal to q k plus r. Um, what does this mean in in actual you know meaning? Well, um, this is just division basically. Um, so when you divide to say j by k as shown over here, you get a quotient q, and you get a remainder. Um, which is basically a uh, part of uh, a fraction. So this is a way of viewing the same process, um, but with division. So what it's basically saying is that if you have a starting number, which you know, is sometimes called a, called a dividend, but you know people tend not to use that language anymore. I think in um, in the school system much nowadays. Um, and then if you have k or dividing number or divisor, then for any starting number and dividing number, you can get a quotient and a remainder. And not only can you find a quotient and a remainder, but those quotients and remainders uh, are unique. So there's only one quotient and one remainder for any um, dividend and divisor, j and k. Um, so here are some examples of what we mean. 21 could be expressed as um, 4 times 5 plus 1. So in other words, 21, if that's the starting number, and 5 is you divide it by 5, and you get 4 with a remainder of 1. Uh, and 26 divided by 8 gives you 3 with a remainder of 2. Um, in other words, if you provide any dividend and divisor, you could find a quotient and a remainder, and they're unique. So, and as I said, although this theorem seems intuitively obvious, the proof is not trivial, and uh, it has some uh, legitimately tricky points in there. Um, so, this is just everything again um, that's essential to understanding the, the statement of the theorem. Um, so let's do this by cases. First of all, k has to be greater than 0, and so either k is 1 or k is greater than 1. So if k is equal to 1, it's very easy to find a quotient and a remainder. Because we could write uh, j, our starting number, is equal to j times 1, which is k, plus 0. In other words, uh, the quotient is equal to j, and the remainder is 0. That makes sense, because if whenever we divide by 1, the, the answer is unchanged. The quotient is just going to be the number you start out with, and there will be no remainder at all. Um, so the case two is what if k is greater than one? Uh, and also for simplicity, in this proof, I'm not going to discuss uh, when the starting number is negative. So assume that the starting number is going to be uh, positive. It's not going to be negative or zero. It's not that difficult to go uh, and prove this for when j is um, a negative number. Um, but you know, just for this uh, video, I, I decided not to do it. Um, and in order to do this particular proof, we're going to use what's called the basis representation theorem, uh, which basically says that a number, any number, can be represented as a sum of powers of another number, and that's called the base, with each power multiplied by some integer that's less than the base. Um, and whenever we talk about, we speak in base 10 or base 2 or base 5, um, this is what we mean. So any number, let's say 7, uh, it can be represented as the sum of powers of any number. So in terms of sums of powers of 2, 7 could be thought of as 2 squared plus 2 to the first plus 2 to the zero. Or, and then I added those 1 times there to show how many of each we're doing. Uh, so 5 is equal to 1 times 2 squared plus 0 times 2 to the first plus 1 times 2 to the zero power. Um, and 413 is just going to be 4 times 10 squared plus 1 times 10 to the first plus 3 times 10 to the zeroth power. This should be fairly clear. If not, um, think about 413 is equal to 4 hundreds plus 1 10 plus 3 ones. That's exactly what we're talking about when you use the basis representation theorem. And the key is we can pick any number to be the base. We're used to 10 most of the time, or 2 if you're interested in computer science. Um, but any number could be represented uh, as the uh, with any base. So that's important for this proof. Um, because that means that we could represent j um, using the base k. So in this case, um, we have j represented by a big algebraic expression that I'll talk more about on the next slide. So here is the algebraic expression that we're talking about. And it kind of looks messy, so let's break down what this is. So first of all, s 
is the highest power we need to represent j. Um, of course, you could say it's like any number could be represented as the sum of every single power of k, uh, but most of them are going to be multiplied by zero. So um, s is the highest power you need to get high enough so that we could represent j. So we have uh, and a, all these a terms, a to the s, a sub s, a sub s minus 1, a sub 1, a sub 0, all of those are positive terms and they're less than k. So those are the numbers we multiply the powers by in order to represent j. Once we have it in this form, uh, we can simplify it a little bit. Um, we can write this with everything the same, except that instead of k to the 0, we just, that's just going to be 1, because anything to the 0 power is just going to be 1. So we can just write a to the 0 at the end over there, and then all the other powers of k uh, remain the same. And once we get in this form, we can factor out a k uh, out of the first part. And we have a k multiplied by a big thing in parentheses, uh, which I could write with that big bracket over there, plus uh, a sub 0, which is a constant. It's a constant number that's less than k because of the basis representation theorem. And we can represent the entire thing uh, in that big bracket below as one number, because it's one big integer, and we can call it q. So j is equal to kq plus a sub 0, and it doesn't take that much to see that this is basically in the form we need. That a sub 0 is r, and that that big thing in parentheses uh, that I bracketed off is q. So, and it also obeys the rule that we need, that r is between 0 and k, because the basis representation theorem means that um, any of the a values has to be less than k uh, and is positive. So this basically means that q and r exist. We found a q and an r given a j and a k. And so the major part of our work is done at this point. So we proved that the numbers exist. Now what we need to do is prove that uh, such a q and r are unique. And uh, so are these unique? What if there are other numbers that worked? And the algebra here can get quite involved, so I just want to talk about it in words and concepts rather than write everything out. So this is what it would look like if we had another Q and an R that worked. So J is equal to K Q prime plus R prime. Um, then Q prime would have a representation in base K, because any number has a representation. We could plug that representation in for Q, and then using the fact that J's representations all must be identical, we could prove that um, k is equal to k prime and r is equal to r prime and through that prove uniqueness. Uh, I'm not going to do this with all the algebraic detail, but I'm just going to kind of draw a sketch over here. So on the very top, we have j is equal to k q prime plus r prime. And instead of writing q prime, I'm just going to open parentheses and say, put the representation of q prime with respect to base k in there. So in that blue parenthesis and the second uh, mathematical expression on the, on the slide, then imagine that you have a representation of k. And then at the very end, of course, you still have plus r prime. Below that is the representation of j we had from earlier in this presentation, um, just our first representation of j. And because representations must be unique, we're able to um, make a one-to-one -one correspondence of every term of these two parts. So everything in the parentheses next to the k's must be the same, and therefore everything on the outside of the parentheses must be the same, because every um, term, every power of k, must be in a one-to-one -one correspondence because j's representation is unique. And if you don't believe me, then, then you should actually try to come up with a representation for q, substitute it in the equation, and then you'll be able to make this comparison yourself. Um, what this means is that uh, because the, our representation was in fact of the form j is equal to k q plus r, that means the representation of q prime must be equal to the representation of q, and therefore uh, q must be equal to q prime, and the stuff on the outside of the parentheses must also be the same. So r prime uh, is equal to a sub 0, which means that r prime is equal to r, or r is equal to r prime. And this proves that, um, that there's uniqueness, because if we show that the, if there is another q and r that work, they have to be the same old q and r that work. So I left out some of the details here, but this is the basic strategy. You need to substitute a representation for q into the equation, 
Uh, and then you'll see that there's going to be a one-to-one -one correspondence of every term in the representations, which allow you to say that the representation of Q has to be equal to the representation of Q prime, and R prime has to be equal uh, to R. So there are a lot of tricky details here that prove something that's uh, actually somewhat trivial, um, but nevertheless it's important to know how to prove uh, intuitively obvious things uh, that are not at all in a rigorous sense obvious.